so I'm pretty jacked today. Here's what's up. I got a hold of Mark Wallace from Parlor Skis, which uh, if you've been following along at all, you know that uh, the professor and I went out to Boston and we built some skis with their ski building class. Uh, drop a comment down below. Let me know what you think. Uh, it was absolutely beyond uh, anything I could have hoped for. Uh, just them guys were busy and, and Mark made the time to chat with me. So uh, if you get a chance, I highly recommend Parlor Skis. I've got a pair that uh, I, I, I want to be clear too that um, we paid for them. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't like they gave us anything. We paid for them, and uh, so not a paid promotion or something like that. But uh, it was it was awesome. If you have a chance or the wherewithal to go and do it, uh, if you can get yourself out to Boston, maybe after the uh, Corona's all cleared up here finally, hopefully soon, uh, get a chance to go see them guys and uh, do their class. They do snowboards and skis both. Um, anyway, it's super cool. So here we go. My first question, I think, was, was um, so Parlor Skis, you guys, I understand you guys started in a, in, in a funeral parlor. Is that something you guys, is that real or is that just on the, is that really how it went? It's factually accurate. Yeah, in, uh, in 20, 2010, uh, we, my, one of my co-founders, the guy who convinced me to build skis, uh, his cousin owned a funeral parlor that he was planning on redeveloping. Um, in Cambridge, and we, he was like, yeah, you guys can set up for a couple months in the basement, you know, and, and do the skis, and then, you know, I'm going to develop the building, you guys can move out, and, and uh, he didn't do a perfect job with the permitting per process, and we were there for four years, actually, uh, while we kind of got the business up and running. It was actually super critical, because we had this space and some time to play around with, you know, the different designs, and the, the different ways we wanted to engineer the skis in our process, and, uh, it's pretty critical to getting us up and going. Nice. So, um, I guess, yeah, maybe a little more background just for everybody that's watching is, but you guys are out of Boston. You've always been out of Boston. I'm not a hundred percent sure with all that. Okay. Um, and then, and so for the, for the uh, viewers, I, I came and did the class. I, um, and I built the, um, I built the, um, Cardinal pros is the ski I ended up with, which was awesome. And, um, I, I got a chance to get them out and ski them. Uh, as I mounted them, um, according to what your re guys' recommendation was, but I also telemark all the time. So I was, uh, I was a little unsure if that made sense. Like, do you guys have, um, a strong telemark, like customer base? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, I don't know if it's representative of the industry, you know, I'd say it's somewhere between five and 10% ish sure. of the sales are telly. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's not a huge part of our business, but it's important. And I think that there are, uh, there are a lot of repeat buyers in the tally space as well. And, you know, we ski in Mad River a lot, which is kind of a, a Northeast stronghold for, for Telmar skiing. And so, and we have a couple, we have a couple early clients who've become really close friends of ours. And we work with them a little bit on, on health points and, you know, some of the different nuances around how to optimize the ski for, for the telly turn, just, you know, the same way we optimize the skis for an alpine turn. But your, your, your general philosophy, if you're designing a ski would be, it's you're gearing it towards alpine. Uh, do you, Cause uh, you don't have mount points for telemark and I just totally, totally dropped it. Right. Yeah, no, no. I mean, we, we provide them. They're not on the website. Oh, right, okay. Say, okay. But, you know, the, the standard alpine mount point uh, is what we recommend for a telly mount. Yeah. Okay. You know, we usually have a conversation. Some people, depending on touring or their style, they like to move a little bit forward, right? Be closer to the true center of the ski for balance points. Um, you know, while we don't design a true telemark ski, like a specific ski, you know, there's certain platforms that, that our tele clients tend to gravitate towards. Um, and again, each person is an individual, but in general, a tele ski is a slightly shorter, a little bit softer. It's usually more traditionally shaped ski. Um, so they gravitate. I said the Cardinal 90s and the Kingfishers are probably the most popular telemark platforms. And obviously the Cardinal Pro, like you got, is, is up there as well. You know, you were looking for a specific spot in your quiver, and I think that ski fit in there pretty pretty nicely. Yeah. Um, um, so, again, there's there's nuance to it. Uh, but, again, because we're building all our skis to order, I think, 
you know, in the same way that not all alpine turns and skiers are the same, you know, not all tele skiers are the same. And so there's, there's a wide breadth that we can handle in there. I, I, I was hesitant to take them out when I first got them because they were like, they, cause uh, we did the custom graphics and everything. And I, I, uh, even mounting them, I was just back and forth and back and forth. And finally I was yeah, like, well, so I want to ski them. I got to put a hole in them. <laughs> I was just, I, I think I, that's the, probably the first time I've measured more than two times to verify I had everything laid out right before I put a hole in it. I was terrified, man. So <laughs> took a few runs. Once I got them, once I got them underfoot though, I, I uh, that's a nice ski that you guys, uh, that we built. So. I appreciate that and all. Um, it, and I would say too, um, Tyler, he uh, he was awesome to work with. Um, so I appreciate him making the time that weekend to do that with me and my dad, um, who also uh, has a terrible track record with breaking skis. Uh, or excuse me, not skis, but just equipment in general. He just got new boots. Um, but he uh, he didn't, he hasn't had any issues with the with the warbirds, but he did break the binders that were mounted to him. So I guess that's good. You know, if you're gonna that's pick good. one to break, yeah. You Right, if you're gonna pick one thing to break, let's not break the custom built ski. <laughs> then uh, you guys, you guys put out a movie. What's it been? Four months ago, back uh, made back east. So you don't know this probably, but um, all my watchers would know this. Is I'm a big Volkswagen guy, and okay. so wh who's who's Vanagon is that? Is that uh, yours? It's, it's, he's one of the, the vagrants guys. So oh, okay. Uh, he has that. It's actually it's it's funny though for. I don't have it anymore, which is very sad. But uh, for years, I had an 84 VW Vanagon. Nice. Uh, in that same brown color. So that one, mine was the Campmobile. That one was um, was not. Just the, that's the Eurovan. But it's, uh, anyway, so it's a, it was near and dear. I couldn't believe he pulled in with the same color, almost the same year Vanagon. And I just, uh, so another thing, and actually, I saw this, I saw this whiskey yesterday at a local bar, and I'm in Minneapolis, right? I saw um, Whistle Pig on their uh, back bar and uh you guys had some kind of collaboration with them um is that is that are those skis what was that, well i guess what was that all about is it was it just the sidewall that had their or was there more to it than the sidewall yeah i mean so we've been we've been friends with the with the whistle pig crew for for a lot of years now they you know they've got a similar sort of philosophy you know it's a little it's a it's a really good whiskey, right? They have a lot of craftsmanship. You know, their whiskey source from a variety of places, but a lot of it's being produced in Vermont now, and that's where they're sort of based. So, you know, we sort of leveraged that relationship with them, and Jeff, the CEO, had asked us to do a project that incorporated the barrel staves into the skis, and that was actually one of the things that kind of kicked off our partnership uh, and friendship with those guys. We did graphics for them, but but the we built skis that had barrel staves. So we actually took the barrel, processed it down, uh, you know, so it's half inch by half inch, and then we actually joined it into the sidewalls. And so it was kind of a cool way. I mean, ski design is, is complicated, right? So we, we had to make sure that they performed well and that, you know, they were the, the right thing. But we did, we were able to include the barrel into the skis. Um, and then we obviously did graphics that, that reflected their branding as well. Awesome. So, so the, the curve of the barrel stave, did that cause any issues or you just had to cut it down more? And then yeah, kind of work. We, we, you know, we had to make the longest straight piece we could. So we either joined two pieces together. We did a 16 inch sidewall and we did a maybe a 32 inch sidewall. We did a double length too. So basically took the longest straight piece so we could have chopped it, planed it, joined it, made it the right size. And then we either joined two together. We used a nice like tight lap joint. Um, or then we started, we did some of it just a single, single piece as well. So yeah, it doesn't work, but the curve is not helpful. <laughs> not helpful got it got it so and i don't know i don't know if i ever actually told you this when we were talking before but um i'm uh, i'm like this close to having my own press in the garage uh nice. finished up and i'm not and i'm not trying to i'm not trying to like build skis and sell them to people but i'm definitely just um some cores and i've got the sidewall attached and i'm just trying to get the shape and everything finished shaping it in the vertical direction I've been kind of struggling with how to do that. It's hard. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so I mean, there there are there are a couple methodologies, right? If you don't have a CNC, we we now use a CNC, but we used one of these in our early days. Uh, so you can you can basically either use a router bridge, yeah. right? 
um, where you create the curve that you want on another part, yeah. uh, either by tracing or by, you know, cutting and sanding. There are a variety of ways to get that curve. You use a piece of PVC pipe. Um, just get the shape. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you basically just run the router back and forth on, on sweat. So yeah. that's one way to do it. Um, it's pretty accurate, very slow. Um, the other way to the other sort of widely accepted way to do it is to basically create a negative mold and run it through a planer. Oh yeah, okay. I didn't think of that. Right. So that's actually how we did it in the early days. We had two. We had a we had a double layer of plywood, and then we had adjustable blocks. Yep. Because we were modeling different flex patterns, so we could we could adjust each set of uh, each, every ten centimeters. We could adjust by as little as a, a millimeter. Gotcha. And so we basically go that, and then we had a then we had a sheet of MDF on the top of that, which was held down to that, so that smoothed and flattened the curve. And then we basically put the cores on top of that and ran them through a planer. And the pressure on the planer down, you plane the top flat, but it creates the delta. Right, right, know, right, right, right. Okay. Okay, interesting. So those are your two best bets. Yeah, I was definitely thinking router bridge just based on the equipment I have on hand, but um. That planer idea, I might have to give that a shot on the next go around. We we looked at both of them and we felt like for accuracy and control, like we wanted to be able to do different stuff. So building an adjustable crib was a little better for us. Yeah. There's no real easy way to do either one. They're both sort of clunky. So right without a CNC machine, which um has been cost you know, for that too. I mean, for there was a long time between when we were doing all hand work and and when we actually bought a CNC where we. Uh, we had a local shop making templates for us, and, and that was that worked really well. Too. That worked out. Okay. Well, that, yeah, that's something I'll have to look into that too. Then, um, you know, I was out to your shop. Obviously, uh, what's the closest? What's the closest resort that you guys all go? Like, you guys all kind of hang out on the weekends, or no? Uh, a little bit. I mean, we all sort of disperse with different, you know, ages and family groups. Yeah, and stuff right. Like that. Uh, I mean, Blue Hills. Super close, local mountain right here in Boston. It's only about 20 minutes from us. Okay. Um, pretty small, but it's got some nice pitch, and it's great to have like a little testing facility and stuff um, close by. I mean, we, um, with everyone, pretty much everyone's on Icon this year, so Loon is only about two hours away in okay. Hampshire. So we did some skis, some team ski days up there, and then um, I ski mostly in, in Vermont, in, in the Waitsfield area, so Mad River and Sugarbush. Okay. Um, I got little kids, so we just, we ran a place up there and just kind of zip back and forth. So yeah, that was uh, that, those are probably the main ones that we go to. Right on. Yeah, I was out. Uh, I was out and tried. Uh, I tried Black Mountain um, in February, and uh, out there in Maine, and it was so it was so windy and cold that I couldn't even. I mean, I, I'd make about four runs and I have to go in for a little bit. I don't know what happened if it was just the mountain or if I'm just I don't know. I mean, living in Minnesota. I, I was even shocked how cold it was. Yeah, that's what I thought. I don't know. Uh, I guess I'll need an extra sweatshirt next time. Uh, it's, it's, let's see. A wide variety of conditions in New England. Yeah, right. That's um, I wasn't sure what to expect. You know, I mean, they say they say if you can ski here, you can ski anywhere. But I'm not sure that that applied to Black Mountain. I, I it tossed me pretty good, but that's that's all right. It was a, it was a uh, it was worth the trip. I guess to circle back to the to the ski construction a little bit, one more question I had was, is there anything like, um, have you seen, have you seen, uh, I think it's third Thursday, those guys that build snowboards out of random stuff um, over at, uh, do you guys, is there any material that you, you just on a whim, you guys tried something and whether it worked out or not, where it, it performed differently than you expected, is there anything that you guys had just, just were like, let's just try this and see what happens? Yeah, for a little while we were um, we were playing with some exotic like tropical woods okay. uh, for sidewall um, to basically like you know get a little bit harder and obviously they wear different and so we used like some like purple heart we used ipe or ipe or whatever you say it um, a couple different types of mahogany and uh, it was crazy they didn't work that well they tore our tools apart oh, okay right? so hard um, and they also just like uh, they they made the skis feel super funky. I mean, it's amazing the difference you can get with the different characteristics of wood that you use within the ski. Yeah. Um, you know, even like we use maple, we, we use maple and ash 
for a little while. We had two different ones, and okay, uh, and they were so the ash was like so different that we ended up dropping it because it just it was like we couldn't even model them the same way because they, they felt different in the ski. So different types of woods we've used over the years, um, and uh, and it does it makes a big difference. Yeah, right on, right on. Okay, well, um, I think. So I, I guess I guess uh, I was looking at the old website. One one more question here, I guess. I was looking at your website and then said you guys kind of all grew up doing. Uh, you know, some of you guys did like uh, collegiate racing, high school racing, all that kind of stuff. What where did you kind of start as uh, as kind of a skier? Did you start out just with the family, or were you doing were you racing and all that kind of good stuff? Or yeah, I mean, I I grew up in uh, I, I was born in Maine. I grew up skiing in Saddleback originally. My mom had skied growing up, um, and but hadn't for years. And so we went on a family vacation when I was four, um, and we went skiing. We went up to Range of Saddleback, a little mountain in Maine. And uh, it, it, according to my mother, it was the first first night that I slept through the night. Hey, there you go. <laughs> so she's like, "Okay, we're gonna do this." And so we started doing it. And I fell in love with the sport. And, you know, my mom was super into it as well. She's a ski instructor for 25 years. You know, she just retired, and so we, we made our way out to Park City. I raced uh, I raced in high school there with the Ski Academy in Park City. Nice. I raced for, for in college, and then for a couple years after college, we lived in Europe and traveled around. So, you know, my my background is pretty strongly race driven. Yeah. Um, you know, and then when I got out of racing and I started. You know, I was definitely missing skiing, and that's when we started this company, you know, as an idea, and and uh, certainly since then, obviously, I don't race anymore, and so I spent a lot more time skiing in different ways, you know, the trees in the backcountry, you know, sort of enjoying all the, the nuances of skiing in New England, and, and that's really opened up, but a lot of, a lot of, I mean, the way I ski now, all that the technique and stuff is, is certainly, um, you know, informed by racing. Yeah, right on. Do you have a, <laughs> I have a very large selection of skis. I shouldn't say this uh, publicly, but do you have like one that you, do you have one that you go to? Like, uh, I love all my children equally is what I tell people. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, and then, which is not, I mean, it's not entirely true. I mean, I, I'd say like the, the couple skis that sort of continually ride. I mean, I ski the McFellin Pro probably the most days yeah uh of any ski even here in new england and that's kind of like my one west coast ski um certainly the cardinal pro 102 has uh been gaining rapidly it's just such a versatile ski um that you know it's it's good in a lot of different conditions so i grabbed that one and then um the warbird too is yeah, just yeah. like really it's just fun and when the conditions are bad it's fun to have a ski that performs really well is really playful in them so uh i'd say those are probably the three that i ski on the most right now but you know i really think that there's within the spectrum i mean we have almost i think we have 16 platforms now and if you include all the custom stuff we do it's way more than that and so i just think there's a there's there's the right ski for everybody and the right ski for everybody on the right day but but there's not like sort of a one one size fits all yeah right right no for sure like anything i suppose um so I, I guess uh, with with all that, is there anything um, anything you want to plug the class or anything like that? You want to just throw on here? Or? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean the build your own skis class is amazing. I mean, you've done it, so you can obviously speak to that. I know you put some stuff up, up on about it earlier. And, uh, yeah. You know, I think it's uh, it's a really cool thing because people who've been skiing their whole life uh, don't necessarily know how a ski goes together. They never really thought about it, and you know, to get connected with your product and to understand how it goes together and what the thinking is and, and have that sense of ownership is, is really great. So um, the class is definitely good. And, you know, I think we have, you know, the ready-made lineup is continues to be super popular with us. I mean, a lot of people, I think, feel like custom skis are intimidating or they don't care about the graphics or something like that. And so that's a great way that you can get, you know, the same quality and attention to detail in a build that, you know, slightly, not only is the, you get them a little quicker, they're a little cheaper, but, um, you know, you, uh, it's not as arduous a buying process, right? You can just go on, find the one you like, pick a length, ask us if you have any questions, and then it's just sort of click to buy. Yeah, right on. Um, now, now you guys, because you guys don't, aren't in any shops, right? Or you are? No, no shops. Not to speak of. Yeah, yeah. Right on.
Well, I uh, I appreciate your time, Mark. And um, yeah, thanks, man. It's great to connect. I hope all's been well for you, and uh, and glad we got a chance to, to chat for a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I appreciate the time. And um... all right, well, hey everybody, that was uh, sorry about that audio. Oh my goodness. Anyway, check out Parlor Skis. Like I said, uh, some great stuff. Mark was awesome to make the time to talk with me again, and I uh, genuinely appreciate it. So. Thanks for watching if you still are, and uh, we'll check back next time.